<laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Board of County Commissioners. Workshop will convene. If we could rise for the pledge, please. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Call the meeting to order. I'll hand it off to the county manager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to bring everyone back to November when we held our strategic, when the board held its strategic planning session. One of the emphasis that came out of that meeting was enhancing public safety. Following that meeting, we, uh, we the board added 30 new positions to the department. Uh, one of the other things that, they, that the board had asked for was a five-year plan. Um, which is what we're going to discuss today. Uh, the other, uh, the other um, component that the board asked for was to talk about uh, the four facilities and our CIP, which we'll be discussing next on the 21st of this month. So today we are here to specifically talk about the five-year plan, how, how, uh, how, how we propose that we're going to grow, and see if you agree with that growth pattern. So with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Abes. Thank you, Ben. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Thank you again for the opportunity. Again, as the County Manager said, we're going to go through an overview of your Department of Public Safety and our operations, and then we'll get into a, a perspective look at our five-year growth plan. Uh, and as the County Manager just mentioned, the question at the end is, do you agree with Public Safety's five-year growth plan, which includes both personnel and capital expenditures that, uh, that we would incur over the next couple of years? Public safety is comprised of five divisions, as you'll see in the uh, five bubbles that are appearing on the screen. The first is emergency medical services, the largest of the five. Uh, EMS responds to medical and traumatic emergencies across the community. Uh, last year, we responded to uh, just over 99,000 responses with 100, excuse me, 99,000 incidents, 110,000 responses from 43 locations. We also have our Leaf Flight Air Medical Program, which is based out of Page Field, uh, and again, the largest of the five divisions. Emergency management, uh, you're very familiar with over the last couple of years between the pandemic and Hurricane Ian. That team prepares in blue skies, working with all of our stakeholders and partners, maintaining plans and uh, making sure that we maintain our relationships with those partners. And then in gray skies, they work to help coordinate that response to major disasters and emergencies. Of course, it's a small team, but they're uh, backed by all of our county staff who rally around the mission and help us during those times of need. Emergency communications, which is known as lead control, answers 911 calls and dispatches for 19 fire departments and the countywide EMS system. Uh, last year, they answered 120,000 911 calls out of their center, which is located on Ortiz. Our public safety technology services has uh, a couple of different functions, of course, maintaining day-to-day -day technology needs across the entire organization, but also uh, they operate two distinct programs. The first is our E911 program, which uh, provides the, the technology necessary to deliver 911 calls to the five answering points across the community. Uh, that includes infrastructure, computers, systems, and all of the integrations necessary to make that work uh, seamlessly for our residents and visitors. And then our government communications network, which is the radio network that serves more than 8,000 public safety, county, and municipal users, providing radio communications countywide. And then finally, administration, finance, and logistics. These are the folks behind the scenes that are helping achieve all of the operational needs from payroll, ordering commodities, uh, distributing those commodities, and all the administrative tasks that go along with that. Uh, the department has 464 full-time employees, and with our on-call and part-time employees, we're nearly 500 strong. And we have a budget of $81 million. You'll see the uh, budget breakdown on the left-hand side of the slide. $63 million comes from general fund, which funds our EMS, our communications, and our admin and logistics programs. We have three enterprise funds that we manage independently. The first is All Hazards, which uh, funds our emergency management program. And then two that fund the programs and technology services, the radio network and our E911 networks. And then finally, we're currently managing uh, $9.2 million in grants uh, to help support our operations. Commissioners, we want to take a minute just to uh, review some of the major capital investments that you've made over the last few years. 
uh, starting in the top left with our government communications network refresh. This is the radio network that all of our first responders use. Uh, we were on uh, outdated technology and analog system. And in 2019, you awarded the, uh, the bid to help do a complete forklift replacement of that system. That was a $15 million investment in the network itself, as well as $3 million in radios for general fund departments and another $8 million in radios for the sheriff's office. Just to give you some perspective on that uh, system, in the first quarter of this year, that system handled 4.6 million push-to-talks. So 4.6 million times people talked across that radio network in the first quarter of this year. And there were no system busies. We were able to, to easily handle that capacity. Uh, in the top right, you'll see the next generation 911 networks, which uh, started with the equipment that's in the communication centers. We celebrated that go live in April of 22. Uh, that empowered us to be able to do text to 911, video messaging, and of course the important advanced location features to be able to locate 911 callers. And now we're finishing that project with the, the second half, which is the core services, which is the, the network behind all of that technology and the communication centers. That in total is a $9.3 million investment. That system handles more than a million calls countywide every year. Your emergency medical services investments include uh, new stretchers and cardiac monitors, both of which were funded this year. That was uh, more than $5 million, and then several smaller projects, but, but projects that have significant clinical implications, uh, like pre-hospital ultrasound probes that connect to our iPads in the field so that we can do ultrasounds on trauma patients to see if they're bleeding internally. Um, we also have IV pumps, uh, portable ventilators, and a number of airway devices, which you have funded in total over the last few years, $5.5 million, and then finally, uh, we have $6 million, more than $6 million in fleet orders that are currently pending, 18 ambulances in total that are, that are on order, uh, and we're expecting the first of those deliveries this fall, uh, again, a more than $6 million investment in the public safety fleet. And of course, we have one other project which we've been watching very closely, the Lee County Public Safety Center, the expansion onto the Emergency Operations Center on Ortiz Avenue. This will provide a, a new communication center for us and other county departments and partner agencies, as well as refreshing technology across the, the campus. Uh, also reconfiguring the entrance to the facility with the expansion of Ortiz Avenue. Uh, we've had to make some adjustments and uh, anticipating more traffic, we'll have an improved traffic flow onto the property. Uh, construction of the facility is well underway. You can see the inset photo there. Uh, that construction is about $30 million. There's an additional $15 million in, in other capital costs, including technology, the entrance uh, enhancements, uh, and other costs on the, on the project to bring it to $45 million in total investment there on Ortiz Avenue. We want to make sure that when we're providing these services that we have not just a, a focus on the outputs, but also the outcomes. And so our uh, first goal when we uh, started this journey together in 2017 was to focus on efficient and effective services through accreditation. Uh, and we sought those accreditation. Our communication center was ACE accredited in fire and emergency medical call taking, but we uh, did not have any other accreditations in public safety. We have since then attained uh, both CAS accreditation for ground medical transport as well as CAMES accreditation for our air medical transport program at, at Page Field. Uh, and our emergency management team is beginning the process of uh, working towards their EMAP certification and accrediting our emergency management program. Uh, but as I mentioned, we really focus on the outcomes and, and what that um, impact uh, of our work has on the community. So for instance, uh, by focusing on the high level of training and efficiencies within communications, in the first quarter of 2024 in Lee Control, we answered 32,000 911 calls uh, with an average answer time of 1.26 seconds and an average time uh, less than 10%, or excuse me, an average answer time of less than 10 seconds, 99.97% of the time. To put that in perspective, the national standard established by APCO, one of the governing bodies uh, in the United States, is 95%. Uh, so we're well in excess uh, of, of the national standards for that benchmark. Clinically, within the EMS system, we are in the top 10% uh, in Florida for resuscitation. And last week, we received our uh, information from the CARES Cardiac Arrest Registry. 
That's a national registry of thousands of agencies across the country. Uh, and I'm pleased to report a couple of important numbers. Uh, in Florida, uh, looking at, uh, in calendar year 2023, cardiac arrest survival to hospital discharge with patients who are neurologically intact, meaning we find them in cardiac arrest and they leave the hospital walking, talking, able to resume their daily lives. In Florida, that rate of resuscitation is 7.8%. In the United States, that rate is 8.1%. And here in Lee County, I'm proud to say that our rate is 12.3%. Uh, we are leading the way in medical care, medical transportation, and we're doing really important things for the community in that space as well. Uh, and then finally, we, we want to make sure that the community sees value and is satisfied with the services. And uh, we've been using for about a year and a half a, uh, a system that allows us to reach out to 911 callers as well as our patients that we treat to, to get uh, just a few hours removed from the call or from the medical care uh, satisfaction score and uh, also some free text comments that we can uh, go back through and review. And our citizen positive satisfaction score is, is 96.54% for call takers and for EMS responders it's 97.15%. These are exceptionally high. Uh, and one of the other great things about this system is that through that uh, process we're using artificial intelligence to be able to identify uh, comments that have negative sentiment, and we immediately grab onto those, connect with those callers or those patients, and help resolve whatever the issue is uh, that they identify. Of course, none of this would be possible without staff working in our five divisions, and uh, we're not immune to some of the staffing challenges that public safety agencies have had, so we've worked through a number of creative staffing solutions that I wanted to also cover this afternoon. Uh, first, in the bottom left, our in-house paramedic school, which was a, a program we started a couple of years ago uh, after identifying a need to be able to bring our own employees who are emergency medical technicians through a one-year program to advance them to paramedic. Uh, I'm happy to say that program has been a resounding success. We have a 100% pass rate, which is uh, incredible for these programs. Uh, and we're looking to not only continue it, but expand it in the future in the new public safety center. Uh, we have a new apprentice program, which we started a couple of months ago in partnership with Human Resources. Uh, and that is looking at individuals that are in local paramedic programs that are currently not working in emergency medical services. And we found a number of those individuals at, at FSW and partnered with them. We bring them in to work as an apprentice and shadow our staff. They get their ride time. Uh, and they have the ability to do some of their, their critical milestones uh, to actually work them into full-time employment once they are credentialed and certified by the state. Um, that is a brand new program, as I mentioned. Those candidates are just graduating from FSW and will be monitoring their progress over the next couple of months. Our communications program is a public safety telecommunicator training center certified by the state. Uh, we do all of our training in communications in-house. Uh, and that is something that is very successful. Again, we have a lot of control over the process and the end product, and that's very important to us to ensure that we get the best return on the investment. Um, we also are reinstating our internship program. This has been sunset over the last couple of years because of uh, the amount of work that we've had due to Hurricane Ian, as well as the pandemic. And we're uh, happy to bring that back in emergency management, as well as public safety technology. And really our vision long term is to see a, a civilian to EMT or civilian to public safety telecommunicator pipeline. The idea that we would go out and find the best candidates who have the drive to be able to go out there and serve the community and we would provide whatever training is necessary to empower them to go out there and do good work. And for us we think that is the, the best opportunity for us to build our workforce in the coming years. So as you requested, we did work, um, and we have been doing work over the last few years to, to expand our growth planning in EMS and communications. And uh, just kind of for, for background, we have traditionally looked uh, 12 to 18 months out to be able to prepare budgets and provide staffing recommendations. Uh, and about two years ago, we started doing a two to three year look out. And now this year, we're, we are advancing to a five year look ahead on, uh, on our growth planning. And I'm going to cover specifically EMS and emergency communications, but also I have a slide that will touch on the uh, planning efforts that are going on in other areas of public safety. 
The growth planning in EMS is uh, incredibly complicated, and, and there's kind of four main areas that we focus on. Of course, in the top left, the first is population growth. We look at the, at the net population growth, and a lot of work goes into uh, working with partners in DCD and other municipal partners to be able to see where is the growth happening, where should we anticipate growth, and where would we potentially need to expand our service area. Uh, and again, EMS is geographic, which means that we not only need to know that growth is coming, but we need to know exactly where that growth is to be able to place the resources, get the staffing, and get it there when the people arrive. And so there's a lot of timing and other factors that go into that determination. There's other volume factors as well, and, and the last couple of years, unfortunately, between the pandemic and then Hurricane Ian, we have had a lot of uh, additional volume that has been uh, on top of the EMS system. And so what we have to do is take some of that noise from the pandemic, the noise from Hurricane Ian and the additional call volume to really drill down and see, okay, what is the underlying volume? Uh, and, you know, I'm happy to report that we did have a seasonal influx this year. It adds additional stress to the EMS system, but it means that there's more visitors that are coming into the community. Um, so that's another portion of those other volume factors that we have to take into consideration, um, constantly looking at what that underlying growth really, really is. The system variables include um, challenges with traffic, and you made an investment at the last board meeting in a new traffic preemption system. We've already had the, the kickoff on that project with DOT. Um, that system has delivered some significant uh, reductions in response times, in some cases uh, double-digit percentage decreases in response time. So we're working very closely with DOT and their staff to get that system uh, implemented later this year. There's also a number of other factors, uh, including the uh, consolidation of uh, hospital service lines and the availability of beds at hospitals across the community, of course. If you are in an area that is not located close to one of those hospitals that has a specific service line, and what I mean by service line is if you're having a heart attack, can we get you to a cath lab? If you're uh, traumatically injured, can we get you to a trauma center? Um, if you're not geographically close to that, then we need to get you to that location, which may mean bypassing other facilities or leaving the community where you were ill or injured. And that has a, an impact on the system as well because that ambulance then has to travel a greater distance to be able to get the patient to the destination, but also travel that distance back to get back into the community to be ready to serve. Uh, we also honor patient choice right now, which is uh, where if the patient wants to bypass a hospital to get to a hospital of their choosing, we, we try as best we can to get them there. However, again, that adds additional stress onto the system, and it may be something that we need to examine in the future. And then on the bottom left is, is behaviors and system utilization, which you know, I think we can acknowledge over the last 20, 30 years has really changed uh, whether you're in EMS, law enforcement, fire services, the way people have used our, our public safety services has changed, and it really has become more of a catch-all for the community's needs, which means that over time we also need to start adjusting to those needs and identify ways that we can start addressing some of those challenges together. So with all those factors in mind, I'll, I'll put the first map up, which is the current station map which includes last year's investments uh, out on Corkscrew Road as well as on Captiva Island. As we're looking at these maps, you'll see the new investments in yellow, and you'll see existing station coverage in purple. The lightest shades, like you see on Pine Island and Sanibel, uh, are where there's one singular resource that can get through that road network within our response time and ordinance, which is 8 minutes and 59 seconds. Where you see the darker shades, that means that we have more than one resource that can get to those locations. And of course, the darker the shading, the, the more resources we have that can get to those addresses. And as you can imagine, the darker shading also correlates to where we would see the higher call density. So more calls that are occurring potentially at the same time in that geography. Uh, we use a county system, uh, the GIS platform, Esri, which we use for a number of different functions. Uh, they have a product called Network Analyst, which allows us to do these simulations. Uh, and we've been able to validate these simulations against our actual response times. Um, so we feel very comfortable with the estimations that we can make based on the software. You'll note that also in Lehigh Acres and on Fort Myers Beach, you don't see shading. And, and our focus really is on the EMS system that the county manages. Of course, we have partners in, in Lehigh Acres and Fort Myers Beach 
who provide medical transport. Uh, I would mention that we are still, since uh, Hurricane Ian, providing an ambulance at Fort Myers Beach Station 32, which is on San Carlos Boulevard. Uh, we still have an ambulance at that location, uh, which we expect to continue for uh, at least the next year or so while they continue their recovery. Ben, can I have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, ben, real quick, I know that through the years we had some ups and downs as far as Lehigh with their services. How are they doing in responses? I know back in 08 to 12 we had that issue where obviously all the districts lost 50 percent of their value in for taxation. There were some issues there a few years ago where they had some shortages. We were having to do a lot of cover up. How are they doing now? Chief Delalo and his team have been doing a, uh, a much better job of, of staying on top of the growth in Lehigh. Uh, and with the addition of the new stations that they have built and new ambulance that they, they've added to those stations, they've been able to improve their response times. We're still out there on a regular basis to assist them. Uh, it's not nearly as frequent as it was a couple of years ago, though. Do they, what's their future five-year plan as far as, like, increasing more trucks out there for service? Are they, do they have a plan for that? They do have a plan. I know that they're planning on building a station at the, near the new park uh, in central Lehigh Acres. Um, and uh, we talk with Chief Delalo on a regular basis. They're, they're continuing to watch the growth models as well. And did they have any asks for the last two years from the state, since the districts are under the state representatives in the Senate, so those districts of Pasadena have been over? Have they had asked for more, any more increase of funding for more stations? I know they had one two years ago. I'm not familiar with their legislative requests. I know that they, they stay in constant contact with their representatives, but I don't know specifically if they had one last year. Thank you. Yes, sir. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, or actually the county manager did, you made an appropriation for uh, staffing for uh, the first year of our growth plan, which, was, um, which we're advancing to this year. Uh, and those two locations were River Hall and Cape Coral Fire Station 12, which is uh, just north of Veterans Parkway uh, on Chiquita. The ambulance in Cape Coral, we expect to go in service 24 hours a day uh, in the next 30 days, we have that staff hired and trained, uh, and they are now credentialed and ready to staff that, that ambulance. We also have staffing that is trained to be able to operate the River Hall ambulance on a 12-hour basis. Uh, River Hall is one of our capital improvement projects, and that is still in the land acquisition phase. So working on the uh, location where we can house that ambulance for a period of time until the land can be acquired and the station can be constructed. In the second year, we would propose to add two additional locations. Uh, the first is on Jacaranda Boulevard East. This is actually closer to Del Prado North and Averill uh, in the S-curves just before you get to US-41. Uh, this is a Cape Coral fire station that is uh, currently proposed. Uh, we would propose to add that location as well as a location along Alico Road near the ITEC uh, FGCU property. Um, that is a strategic location for us, not only because of its access down Alico and into uh, Wild Blue and the other uh, developments that are occurring near Alico and Ben Hill, but also its proximity to the airport. The airport is our single busiest address in the county for EMS calls, and uh, we currently have a paramedic that is on a, a, one of the crash trucks at the airport to be able to provide advanced life support care there, uh, but we still have to bring an ambulance off property to the airport terminal to be able to provide medical transport for those patients should they need to be transported. In the following year, there are three stations recommended. The first is located in Alva. Now, currently we have a paramedic on the fire truck in Alva as well. So this location would only require the addition of three EMTs to be able to fully operate that ambulance on a 24 hour basis. Uh, we also have a proposal for Babcock, which is in our uh, CIP right now. That is in land acquisition as well. That land we expect to acquire later this year so that we can begin station design uh, sometime around the first of the year. And then finally, a location located in uh, Cape Coral, north central Cape Coral on Douglas Parkway. This is off Santa Barbara, about a block to the west uh, in far north Cape Coral. Uh, there's a lot of growth and development happening, not only along Burnt Store, but also in the, the northwest portions of, of Cape Coral. This would assist us greatly with the coverage in, the, in that part of uh, the Cape. 
In the next year, we would propose locations along Corkscrew Road uh, at the far eastern end of Corkscrew near TPI Road. Um, that location would help serve the growing communities. We've added a resource there um, with the, the place community that, that opened first. Uh, we're currently co-located with Astero Fire Rescue on Corkscrew at Station 45. Uh, we would look to add an additional station. Uh, you know, on the map, it doesn't look that far until you get out there and you drive between those communities and you realize uh, it is quite a, quite a distance. And then to get back into those communities is a challenge. And so we, we need to have a second location at the far eastern end of Corkscrew. And then looking at potentially a co-location or a new project that would potentially go uh, near uh, Bonita Springs, excuse me, Bonita Beach uh, Road and um, where 751 comes up from uh, Collier County. Radio Tower Road, I believe, is the road that goes to the north. We're looking in that general vicinity. And then finally, in the final year of the growth plan, are two additional locations. Uh, the location in Cedars Parkway is another proposed Cape Coral fire station. I've mentioned that a lot. We have a good relationship with uh, the city of Cape Coral and Cape Coral Fire, and we've been able to be in lockstep on some of their projects and uh, are looking at, at optimizing the use of those facilities as much as possible. That Cedars Parkway location is behind the Publix at Burnt Store and Veterans, uh, just to give you kind of a, a frame of reference. Not only that would that help us with our Cape Coral responses, but it would allow us to get back into Matt Lachey uh, and onto Pine Island very quickly. And then you'll see that ITEC is indicated again. This fiscal year is also when the port has proposed uh, additional head houses on some of the concourses and potentially the addition uh, of a, a full concourse onto the airport. Uh, we want to start projecting that growth and that need uh, and the potential for an additional ambulance in that area. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, we're also looking very closely not just at adding resources, but also at how we utilize the resources uh, within public safety and emergency medical services. Currently, when you call 911, and this is kind of the traditional model that has been used uh, across the country, you call 911, an ambulance is dispatched, somebody makes a determination on whether you need to be transported or not, and uh, you may or may not be transported to the hospital. Uh, we are currently using uh, telehealth. We've been working uh, for the last few years with a startup in the market called MD Ally. Uh, MD Ally is a company that specializes in EMS and uh, pre-hospital telehealth services. Uh, one of the things that we were really drawn to is the idea that they offer a, what they call a care concierge service. So this is an all-encompassing service, not just for whatever you're calling for in the moment, but also to address population health issues like can you get your prescription delivered or do you need mental health care? Do you have a primary care physician? All of these things that they can do after the fact to try and, and prevent a future call to EMS. Um, one of the other advantages is that they have an incredibly fast response time. Uh, unlike other telehealth services, when you're calling 911 and are diverted to this service, there's the expectation that that's gonna happen just as rapidly as an ambulance arriving at your home would be. And so what we're seeing with MD Ally is uh, from the time that the call is transferred to them, the patient is video chatting with an emergency boarded physician within five minutes, uh, which is incredible. Um, we've gotten great feedback, not only from staff, but also from the patients that we have served through that service. And so what we are looking at from a future model standpoint is the idea that when the 911 call comes in, that we would use our call processing software to be able to identify if it was potentially a low acuity call that could qualify for telehealth. And if it qualified for telehealth, then we would give telehealth the opportunity to be able to screen that call and potentially provide care to that patient, like I said, in, in about five minutes with a boarded emergency physician and avoid the entire EMS encounter. Um, again, we're solving the patient's issue at the same time that we're keeping that resource available for the community. If the call requires, uh, you know, if the physician identifies that that call requires uh, evaluation by EMS or transport to the hospital, then that call can drop right back into our queue and we immediately dispatch a resource. In addition to ambulances, we're also looking at community paramedics, which are practitioners that are uh, trained to evaluate low acuity calls as well as uh, issues that arise with chronic conditions like congestive heart failure. 
Um, these are individuals that can go out, they can stabilize those conditions, and they can correct those issues without having to rely on transport to the hospital. Again, we're avoiding that patient even having to, to go to the hospital in the first place uh, and solving their, their issue uh, right where they are. We're also looking at options for basic life support transport, meaning the, the basic life support or the, the low acuity calls being transported by other resources, as well as the idea of tra uh, transport in the right time frame. And what I mean by that is instead of getting somebody to you each and every time, lights and sirens in 8 minutes and 59 seconds, should the standard for some of those types of calls that are lower acuity that may not need immediate treatment and transport, should that standard be 15 minutes or 20 minutes? Again, still getting somebody to the patient's side to be able to address that issue and transport them, but not every emergency that we're called to requires that full lights and sirens response to the scene and all of those resources coming to the patient's side. You'll see in the blue box below that the mention of our critical care units and the Leaf Light Air Medical Program because while we talk about all of these different uh, service potential uh, service uh, ideas, we are still going to be uh, exceptionally well trained in addressing cardiac arrests, traumatic injuries, strokes, uh, heart attacks, all of those critical emergencies. What we're trying to identify are the opportunities to address the lower acuity emergencies in a different way that doesn't burden the EMS system and doesn't necessarily burden the hospital as well. Again, for transport, there's the options of the, of the ambulance on scene diverting that patient to telehealth or potentially asking a community paramedic to be dispatched to address that condition. And then finally, as a last resort, you know, we can always transport those patients to the hospital. Um, the state has empowered us to begin transporting patients to local urgent cares. Um, however, uh, we don't see the availability of urgent cares uh, exceeding the availability of our hospitals right now. And so um, that's not a, a, an outlet that we're necessarily pursuing at this time. I want to shift gears for a moment and talk about communications um, and our emergency communications program and how they do their analysis as well. Um, you know, unlike EMS, there are no geographic factors when it comes to staffing and projecting growth for our communications program, um, which is nice, um, but we still have to look at what the community-wide growth is and what that call volume is going to look like over the next few years. And so our staff has worked with DCD again to identify the potential development projects that are coming online, um, and then they've developed a factor by which they multiply the, the number of potential uh, rooftops that are coming online to, to derive what that call volume would potentially look like. And then we inject that number into a, a call queuing analysis to be able to identify the number of call takers that we need at our peak volumes. Um, and this is where we, we get the staffing numbers that help to drive what our future growth requests look like in that five-year plan. Uh, I do want to mention that we continue to operate in a primary and secondary 911 PSAP model, meaning our primary answering points are our law enforcement agencies, so the Sheriff's Office, Cape Coral, Fort Myers, and Sanibel Police. Uh, our 911 center accepts those calls if they're fire or medical in nature. And so we expect that about 40% of the total 911 calls are going to come over uh, to our center, and we, we have to be prepared for that. Um, and we continue to work with those partners to make sure that that is as efficient as possible. So to get into our staffing needs and our five-year growth plan, you'll see on the chart here the different projects and, and capital investments that we have um, on, on track for the next five years. Of course, the far left column was advanced this year with your staffing allocation in uh, November. Uh, you'll note that the fiscal year 24-25 column is blank. Uh, we understand the, the current financial environment, and we're working very closely with the county manager and uh, of course, uh, Mr. Winton on, you know, what that might look like in the future. Um, but we are looking at how that staffing plays out into years three through five to be able to bring those resources online. Uh, you, uh, again, I will note that if you look at ALVA, that is three full-time equivalents because we have a paramedic on the truck out there already, so we only need three instead of six staff. You'll also note that these emergency communications line at the very bottom, those are our 911 call takers that we would add uh, to the system as well over the next five years. 
And of course, all of this also uh, needs capital and, uh, and different projects that we are working on. You'll see the current uh, amended budget in the third column for all of our CIP projects. This is by far the most robust CIP that public safety has had in our history. Uh, of the 67 million, you'll note that about 45 million is in the EOC expansion project on Ortiz. And there's about $22 million in residual uh, projects that are funded in the current budget. Uh, in our CIP, a little preview for uh, two weeks from now, our CIP, we have requested an additional $21 million over the next five years. Uh, we're working very closely with uh, the county manager and his staff to be able to phase those projects further out in the five-year plan uh, so that there's less of an impact uh, next fiscal year, understanding the, the financial pressures that we have. I also wanted to draw your attention to the second column uh, on the table there, and you'll note that most of these projects are in the general fund CIP. Uh, and one of the questions that we get asked on a regular basis is uh, in regarding to impact fees. And, you know, can impact fees fund the expansion of our services? Uh, currently, the, the impact fee for emergency medical services is $55 per residence. Um, and in contrast, uh, 13 of the 18 fire districts have impact fees of $766 per residence. And just to kind of give that some, some more context, if you have a development of 2,400 homes, the EMS impact fee for that project would be $132,000. The fire impact fee and 13 of those 18 fire districts would be 1.8 million. If the impact fee was similar to what we saw in other areas for, for other um, public safety services, we could potentially fund the growth uh, through those impact fees, uh, but the impact fee for EMS is exceptionally low, and unfortunately, because of the restrictions in statute uh, under the Impact Fee Act, uh, the board would not be able to aggressively raise that, that impact fee over the next couple of years. There's restrictions on how fast and how much you can raise that impact fee, which means that a lot of this growth, unfortunately, falls on the shoulders of the general fund. And as I mentioned earlier, I did want to touch on the other areas of public safety before we get back to the question today. Um, our emergency management team is working on uh, looking at the alignment of the resilient Lee plan and our existing plans and projects that we have ongoing. They're also looking at a lot of our public safety projects to see how can we build greater resiliency in our other programs and projects uh, in the future. And an example of that is in technology services where we're working on a project uh, to potentially build some uh, resilient and hardened uh, radio infrastructure. That's an example of uh, you know, how we're using the outputs of that resilient lead plan to drive what our future planning efforts look like. Uh, in technology services, they're spending a lot of time on the rapidly emerging technologies. Uh, we have a drone program that we are working on right now. A lot of work in the spaces of, of uh, AI and machine learning and how those technologies can help improve the way that we do our work each day. Um, and a lot of this is also around um, new technologies like Starlink, which we use during Hurricane Ian and low earth orbit technologies where we can deploy those to help provide greater redundancy and resiliency at some of our remote locations. And then finally, I wanna to touch on logistics and administration. You know, in the last five years, while we have seen growth in other parts of public safety, uh, we have added one position to public safety logistics and no positions within public safety administration. And uh, we've seen a significant increase in the number of uh, responses and the number of uh, responsibilities across that team, and that's something else that we'll be looking in the out years to, to reevaluate and look at those opportunities as well. And so, commissioners, we'll come back to the question that we started with uh, at the beginning uh, regarding the five year growth plan. I guess the first question, Ben, you just left on the topic of the impact fee. I know that based on the states, our legislation got passed two years ago, we kind of raised impact fees a certain amount, I forgot what it is, 2% or something per year. Are we following that now with that rate? Is it set now, or the collection rate? The collection rate is set by the board, and that is set for the term until it is changed again. There are restrictions on how much you can uh, increase it. You cannot increase it greater than 
50% of the current fee. And if you increase it, uh, you have to phase that increase in. So, for example, if you were to, uh, to go to the maximum of a 50% increase, uh, you could potentially take that from $55 to, uh, $55 to $82.50, but you would have to do it $6.88 a year over four years. That's what I'm saying. It's just so much a percentage. I couldn't remember how much it was, 2 or 3% a year. You can only increase it. So yeah. I know at one time we were increasing it every year on a, gradua a graduation. I wasn't sure if we're still doing that or not. No. Okay. We're not Pete? Okay. okay. And also, is that built in any of the prop shares? For example, like new development for course crew, they're paying prop share plus impact fees. Is that prop share going to any of the EMS or is it all just for roads? In some cases, we have developers that do a prop share that comes to EMS. So that, that, is, that is growth paying for new growth into a certain point. This it is, yes. Prop shares for the impact fee collection, which Correct. is actually passed on to the homeowners with somebody who just bought a house last year. You pay the impact fees a separate line item. So, okay, thank you. Ben? Yes, sir. Um, I will verify the MD Ally works. That's pretty amazing. Um, I have two questions. One is, uh, the outcomes is pretty spectacular. We talk about 1.26 seconds. I mean, that's amazing. <clears throat> I don't know how much further you can squeeze that down. Uh, and will that, if, if any improvement comes through that, will that be through technology or will it be through just uh, physical stations that can get, get there sooner and that type of thing? So I, I'm sure it's a balance. Um, but you, you try to wonder how you squeeze this down. And maybe a part of that, when I first looked at page nine, it said behaviors and utilization. I try to think of what the EMS people are dealing with out there. And there's obviously the heart, heart attacks and so on and so forth. But where does fentanyl fit into this? And how that impacts the teams, how it impacts the uh, patients? So to address the first question, the, the 1.26 seconds, it will be very tough to be able to get that uh, any further uh, closer to zero. 0.26 seconds, that's, that's at that point largely just a limitation of the technology and the ability to, to get that call into the ear of the, the call taker I in that amount of time. Folks, I mean, it's, it's, you just go, how fast can you do that? But it's amazing. It, 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 it's, it's incredible. And again, that's a testament to our call takers taking that call, getting the, the units dispatched, and then immediately becoming available to answer the next call. Um, and, you know, 1.26 seconds is, is incredible. Regarding the question on, on fentanyl and, and opioid overdoses, um, we've, we have always had uh, you know, policies and, and medical protocols related to opioid overdoses. Of course, we've seen different uh, substances that you know, emerge into the community, and so we have to respond in some cases differently to that. Um, we, we have not seen locally. We, we've seen a sustained volume, and from time to time we may have uh, maybe a week or two where we see an increase, a significant increase. Um, and in some cases, we can localize that to a geographic area, and we work with law enforcement in those cases. Um, but we have just seen a, a fairly sustained rate of uh, opioid overdoses, um, which also means a, a higher than normal, but a sustained rate of responses to those overdoses. Um, and not only is it taxing to the EMS system, um, but it has, it has tangible impacts on those patients. Um, and it, it draws a lot of resources, especially when we see those surges. We see some of the things on the news, and all of a sudden the responder is affected by it, and he or she goes down, you know, and all of a sudden the whole thing goes sideways. And, um, but if it's manageable uh, to the best you can, that's fine. But you worry about them. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I think it's a great presentation, really uh, enjoyed seeing the different areas. And I think you're, you're tracking right along with what we've seen at our, you know, zoning hearings too, about where the, the growth seems to be coming. Um, uh, I had a question on slide 14 um, with the staffing needs on the five-year growth plan. You know, what do you foresee as the impact of if you don't add any positions in the 24-25 fiscal year? Are we gonna get behind? I think that's something that, you know, if that became the, the outcome of the budget that we would anticipate staffing in a, uh, or preparing in a way that we could aggressively um, address 
potentially increase staffing in 2526. Um, you know, our, our preference would be to add those positions gradually, uh, but we also want to be respectful of the position that the board's in financially. Um, and, you know, that's something that we'll work with, with the CFO and, and the county manager on, on what that looks like. Mr. Chair? Yeah, I was, if I may, um, you know, we will also work with public safety as, as we move through, forward, specifically when we receive the tax roll sometime this year, if for some reason we need to do something, that'll be the time we'll, we'll be able to adjust and bring that back to the board. So, yes, this is what we're looking at right now, but there may be potential in the future. Um, and we'll, we will definitely, you know, keep the board informed as we move forward. So if, if, if we um, get a couple good estimates um, when we start to get the tax rolls, there's a potential you could maybe pull some of those positions that are planned for the 25, 26 year, pull those into the 24, 25 year? Yes. Okay. That's correct. Okay. On a positive note, Ben, great job. Thank you to all your team and everything. I, I, this is another great example of so many good things going on in Lee County. And Dave, you, you and your team should be really honored and proud to. I, I think so many people, are, they see one animals or two of them. This is, I'm sure the general public. Yeah, 464 employees, $81 million budget. That budget is larger than some cities in the area budget just for EMS public safety and people don't think about administration and logics and everything it's just so important it's another great topic you can just take this one agency and just showcase it on behalf of Lee County showing what we do it's one of the most important services we provide Lee County I mean nobody wants to see an ambulance it's kind of like insurance you don't need it till you need it and when you're just there we have great services and I think it's a perfect opportunity and it's just unfortunate people I mean I don't know if we can do PSAs or what we can do to get the message out about I mean, you might just look at the five-year projection. What we currently do in Allen County with the team we have at EMS and the service they provide is unbelievable. I mean, I was just sitting in that town hall last week with the, with the service representative, the senators, and they had one of, the, one of them make a comment that we only have one employee in Lee County. You know, and to hear somebody sitting in an office that's elected that thinks we only have one employee in Lee County when you have a team of thousands of people that make up services, you know, well, we're not the government. The employees are the ones that's doing all the work. You say we have 464 employees here. We have 1,700 of the sheriff's department. Yeah, code enforcement, animal services, and all these parks and rec, all these other agencies together provide this great community the services we have. And that's why, again, we need to keep pushing that message. This is what happens in Lee County. This is why we have circular services. In case you're at the beach and there's an accident, you're going to get service. And it's just another great opportunity to provide the correct information that people have not informed uh, how many employees we really have in Lee County and what services we provide. Agreed. Thank you. So you have an opportunity to do it. And I have a question. Um, yes, I know you obviously placed 30 odd people. How long did that take? Uh, are you referring to the, the positions from November? Uh, we just did another hiring class uh, last week. Um, we were able to get the positions for those two ambulances. Those staff were hired in January. Um, they are now trained and, and coming online as credentialed providers. Um, we have another class that is starting, like I mentioned last week. Um, so it, it takes anywhere from, from six to 12 months to be able to get that staff on board. And that's one of the things from a, from a capital and a staffing and equipment perspective that we want to try and balance so that when uh, a capital project is having a ribbon cutting and, and that station is ready to open, the ambulance is there, it has all of the equipment that it needs, and the, the staff are hired and trained and ready to operate that location. I appreciate that. With that being said, do you think it's going to be difficult to go back-to-back -back years when you need more than 30 people in 25, 26, 26, 27? You just indicated it might take you a year to do 30. Are we putting ourselves in a hole by pushing off 24, 25 to then have the burden of trying to hire 38 people? It certainly makes it challenging. And I think one of the things that we want to do through some of those other uh, staffing concepts, the in-house paramedic program, uh, the apprentice program, is to try and smooth that so that we don't have that, that big lift at the beginning of an increase in, or expansion of service. Um, but it is challenging, and it does require a, a number of staff just to be able to run those programs. Then I've got one more. The hospital 
business, we'll say, is changing rapidly. I was talking to some friends up in Tampa, and there's more and more and stuff like this. Where they're located has an effect on how we service them, so on and so forth. Does our plan, I assume, overlap with them, or I, I guess we're in constant communications on what their for going forward plans are and how we respond to that? So I think that's a, that's a complicated uh, challenge for the community. Uh, we've seen a lot of those service lines, as I mentioned, um, consolidate to Gulf Coast Medical Center, which means that those transport times from some of the communities uh, are longer. Um, and uh, we do work with them, but you know we would we would like to see more growth in the in the services that are provided, especially in Cape Coral. That's an area that currently does not have um, those critical service lines for heart attacks, strokes, and traumatic emergencies. Um, those are all centralized at Gulf Coast, and so all of those patients have to leave Cape Coral uh, to be able to get that care. Can we potentially look at what cost it might be to maybe split the number that we're looking at for the year after next, just to understand what the cost is? I mean, if it's going to take us the lead time you're talking about, I mean, if it's going to take us a year and a half to full 38 people, and then the pressure is going to be the following year, you have 30 plus people that you need to do. I'm just curious what, if you split the number of 38 and you split it in half, what that cost would be. Yeah, we'd be happy to, to provide that to you. I'd love to just know what that is just from a planning point of view because um, it may be unrealistic to be able to go back to back with 38 and 32 people in the time frames. And if cash flow is the issue, we may be trying to do something that cash flow is going to take care of by itself because you're not going to hire these people quick enough anyway. I can't hire them, so I can't put it in cash flow. Ergo, it doesn't have an impact on our dollars. And if you could only process X number of people in a class, I don't know how you'd ex, you know, expedite this process. But I'd love to have some little bit more information. That'd be helpful. I don't have a problem with your plan. Um, listen, this is indicative of us growing the way we are. This is indicative of the population and the people that are here. We're just talking about that lunch. And, you know, more people are, are, are here 12 months out of the year. It, we're no longer a six-month community. Uh, more and more people that have moved here have moved this as permanent home, and they're here 12 months out of the year. You can just tell it by the roadways. You tell about, you know, you go to stores, you go to restaurants. It's May. You used to be able to, 10, 15 years ago, right after Easter, you'd certainly notice a dramatic difference. Someone that lives in the Cape, I haven't seen a dramatic difference. I haven't seen any difference. I mean, my commute's the same 45 minutes to work. So um, I just would want to look at numbers if we can do that. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, as we progress with our budgeting, we will definitely provide that number in the next next session that we have with the board, a work session that we're, I think we're talking CIP next week or the next board meeting, so we can uh, present that as well at that point in time. Appreciate it. Yep. I agree with the five-year plan. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I second that. I, I agree with the, uh, not that it's an official second, by the way, Richard, don't get nervous, but <laughs> but I, I agree with the sentiment there that, you know, this is a, a good five-year growth plan. I, I think y'all are really on the right track. It's a great start. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I, I would love to see that scenario laid out about pulling some of those uh, positions forward so that we don't go a year without hiring new. Just at the rate we're growing, I just think that's good planning, so... Yeah, we'll do. Any other issues, gentlemen? Anything else, County Manager? No, not this time. Call for an adjournment. Thank you all. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Ben. Good job.